You know, we're still very much are struggling to, you know, getting like a robot to hand over a water bottle, you know, or, or, or like getting a system that has learned a certain task to like learn something else without being trained on it for hours and hours on it. So there's still a lot of basic technical challenges that we are dealing with. So, so, so those risks, those, those risks are, are quite far away. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott providing a rational, evidence-based perspective addressing important societal issues. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. On this episode, I'll be continuing my series of discussions on artificial intelligence, the promise and the risk. We've had some interesting interviews and on this one I'll be interviewing an expert on the ethics of artificial intelligence. Again, if you enjoy this content, please hit like and share it with a friend and join the conversation on my Facebook page at Al Scott Rational. Shalale Rizmane is a PhD student in electrical and computer engineering at McGill University. She's a member of the Responsible Autonomy and Intelligent Systems Ethics or RAISE lab. Her current research focuses on how we can measure the adherence of AI systems to AI ethics principles. She is currently the co-director and design researcher at the Open Roboethics Institute, previously the Open Roboethics Initiative, which was established in 2012. ORI is a Canadian think tank investigating the ethical and social implications of artificial intelligence and robotics. Ms. Rizmani, welcome to The Rational View. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for coming on the show. So could you tell our listeners a little bit about your background and how you came to be where you are now? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I started uh, in engineering um, and basically was very much interested in um, a lot of different fields uh, and I ended up going into robotics because it combined a lot of uh, sort of mechanical system, electrical system, computer system. And then I, in our robotics courses, I noticed that we're learning how to build robots, but not necessarily why we're building them and then uh, what is this going to do for the world uh, necessarily. And I had a mentor who asked me, aren't you worried that the system that you build is going to someday be in somebody's hand and that's not going to use it um, in a proper way? And that question sort of haunted me, honestly, uh, quite early from uh, quite early on in my education. And then uh, from then on, I decided to f uh, learn a little bit about like science and technology studies in general and what how we should be uh, studying the implications of what we are building. Uh, so I've, I've done that in the context of robotics, medical devices and AI systems more recently. So. OK, that's that's a. Cool. You, you must have had a very good uh, supervisor to, to help you with that uh, decision. Um, could, so you are a co-director of the Open Robo Ethics Institute. Can you tell me about the institute? Yeah, so um, ORI so, uh, started, uh, as, as mentioned, like, as an initiative in 2012. Uh, when I, as, and we were basically a group of researchers and students from University of British Columbia and mm -hmm. internationally. From the, um, and we were just you know, mainly looking for an outlet to have a conversation about these issues. So right, it, like right now, there's a lot of discussion around AI ethics, but in 2012, uh, you couldn't really actually find much on this topic, especially in the popular media, uh, or even like uh, proper outlets in within the academic environment, really. So we uh, sort of got together and started doing some public uh, opinion polls on issues around autonomous cars, um, care robots, lethal autonomous weapons, and uh, and some of the I guess over in in around 2015 when we were doing it, one of our studies on lethal autonomous weapons was a pretty large study for the time, and it got picked up by the media and then we actually got to present part of the results of that in the UN convention uh, for uh, certain conventional uh, weapons and one of our other directors is actually still part of that um, sort of expert group. Wow! So did you get to address the UN? It was me. It was a more senior, more senior director. Uh, but uh, yeah, it still was great to be part of the team who actually got to write the report for that. And um, yeah, that's cool. So, could you explain maybe for our listeners why you feel it's important to address ethics and in artificial intelligence? Is this 
a unique concern, a unique area of software engineering that ethics is especially important in? It's definitely not a unique issue for engineering in general, but I, I, I will uh, sort of uh, explain why it's a bit different here. So in, as an engineer um, and uh, building any form of technology, you're inherently responsible for uh, making sure that uh, you know what are the implications of this technology from a social standing point, ethical standing point, economic, environmental, and that you consider them in your design process. Uh, that is especially within the Canadian um setting, uh, you know, we, we uh, wear an iron ring and we sort of take a note to be responsible. So uh, in that sense, uh, you know, any type of technology you build, you carry that responsibility with you. Now, when it comes to AI systems, uh, there is a, there's a few interesting points. Uh, one of them is that these systems are quite unique um, in that they actually have the, cap the cognitive ability to make a decision uh, at some level. So this could be like a very simple decision um, of recommending what movie you should watch uh, or much more complex decisions of how a car should drive around. Um, so this is quite unique because they can actually, the, these systems to an extent could make these decisions without any human intervention at the time of decision making. So uh, this is very different than some of the other technologies that we built. So for example, medical devices, you generally build a medical device and it's somehow used and administered by a physician or a nurse or somebody else from the, in a medical team. Um, so th there's the decision maker is mainly a human being. So the shift in who the decision maker is, I think makes these makes the ethical issues quite unique for when it comes to these AI systems. Um, and also um, AI systems, I guess, uh, got really uh, developed more so uh, in like, I mean, AI has been in works for more than, you know, 50 years now, uh, but uh, the systems and the applicability of it in the real world became a lot more uh, prominent in 2012. So it's been a very fast development. And I think as a society and as regulators or as technologists, as designers, we haven't quite figured out how to really capture the best parts of these and how to like mitigate the worst parts of these systems. It's very interesting. You say, um, you know, the decision-making process is somewhat unique in artificial intelligence. And it brings to mind the old adage, to, to err is human, but to really screw things up requires a computer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Are, are, are you aware of people using AI irresponsibly that have had uh, bad effects on society? Um, so I would say, yes, there is definitely um, cases that things, uh, cases where, uh, you know, we definitely would have wished something else. Now, whether this is like a, for ex like a very much an intended consequence, like whether somebody, you know, started using it uh, to, in to intend uh, something bad, uh, or whether that was more of an unintended consequence, I find that within the case of AI systems has been a lot of the mishaps have been quite unintentional, or like most people were not aware, they were designing for something else. So um, just to give a, a bit of a context, so, I think one of the scenarios or one of the areas where we have uh, really have had some challenges with uh, ethical issues when it comes to AI systems is how we are using AI systems within uh, the information systems around us. So any platform that we're getting any sort of information from um, generally has some sort of a, an AI and it's system incorporated in it. So I'm talking about mainly the digital platform. So for example, some, the platforms like Google Search, which uh, you know 80% of, I believe, uh, Americans actually use that to get the information that they're getting on a daily basis, um, or social media platforms on our news feeds on social media platforms, or even uh, like video, video hosting platforms like YouTube. Uh, they all use AI uh, technology or quote unquote machine learning technology to learn from the user and their habits, and based on that, re recommend and sort of direct their attention in a certain way. So uh, with Google, uh, the, the key issue here is that uh, when these companies are designing these systems, uh, they're not necessarily designing them to give us the most accurate and the most contextually appropriate information. They are mainly designing these systems to um, satisfy uh, their, their, sort of their profit 
needs and requirements and and also uh, to satisfy some of their uh, stakeholders that are providing their money. So mainly in this case, advertisers. So they're making them addictive, right? Yes, exactly. So they're making them addictive and they're also, it's, it's a money, it's a, it's a way of like making money basically for that business. But, but that, when that happens, when they're designing for that objective, certain other issues that happen is that, for example, the eco chambers are created where people tend to see, see what they like to see or um, radical views are sort of uh, promoted more. And I think these are ethical implications uh, for society and that, you know, it's a huge challenge for us, to, I think, to deal with this er- uh, era of like, quote unquote, like misinformation or disinformation. Yeah. The polarization of social media is, is becoming a, a huge factor that people are aware of and, and it's driving a division in society and it's having huge effects on, on democracy even. To, people are, are in these echo chambers that are set up. So these echo chambers are set up by artificial intelligences run by the social media platforms effectively in their how they serve information to people has no basis of truth. It's based on what they want and, and feeding this addiction. Yeah, to an extent, yeah. And I, and I want to iterate that uh, to an extent these companies now have realized this and I also are, uh, you know, are coming up with ways to actually act against the problem. So they're also coming up with ways to detect what's fake news or to report, you know, uh, the misinformation, disinformation. So I think uh, they have also come a long ways over the past few years to actually address some of these issues. Um, However, you know, it's an example of very much an area where a lot of work needs to be done. Interesting. I'm glad I'm glad that they're coming around uh, slowly. Uh, hopefully uh, before democracy falls apart. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. So as a PhD researcher, you yeah. are at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence ethics. What are some of the concerns that you're dealing with in your research? Yeah. Um, so my research uh, is still information, but I would say one of the major questions that uh, sort of uh, was very interesting uh, it, it was very interesting to me last year, and it still is something I'm working on, um, is that um, when most of the time when we're designing a lot of other um, uh, devices, like other technologies, like for example, if you're designing like a bridge or um, a roller coaster or something else, uh, we have a sense of like what failure means or what safety means and what we should do and what we shouldn't do just based on the laws of physics <laughs> to an extent of all the you know laws of mechanics and design so but whereas when it comes to ethics you know we want to say we want to build an ethical ai system but what does that mean how do we ever really know that that is now we've made it you know we've made an ethical AI system we've gotten there and i think a lot of people you know there's a lot of conversation this field of ai ethics is very new i would say it's like five years really the conferences that are in the area have like are four maybe four years old three years old super super new field so you know some people are saying an ethical ai system is a fair system some people are saying an ethical ai system is a transparent system um or one that is a cap- that's accountable to somebody or, you know, some in some. So there's a lot of different opinions of what the ethical AI system is, but uh, and, and there aren't and they don't necessarily give each other and that we don't actually have a way of like uh, measuring really progress in this area. So what I've been looking at is uh, I've been looking at how people are sort of defining in different ways what a ethical AI system means and I've been trying to see how they've been trying to measure ethics in any shape or form and uh, I'm basically trying to look at can you know uh, how are we doing that now uh, how should we do that can we measure ethics um, so those are the questions that I'm dealing with at this moment to see if we can come up with some sort of like a benchmark for ourselves to see okay we're here now this is where we are and now we want to get here so we can actually come up with a plan of going from point A to B. So you feel you can, do you feel you can put a number on a, on a, on an AI system, like a narrow AI system that does a certain thing? Can you quantify, your, your goal is to quantify how ethical this, this system is. And, you know, these systems aren't human. They don't understand ethics as we do. They just, it, it happens or it doesn't happen as a side effect of whatever it is doing its job. How how do you do this? This is really interesting to me. 
Um, so I think that the answer, I guess, to this question is going to come from a more some a little bit from a technical level where we get to like, in some sense, we have diagnostic tools like just like you know with the tire like a car tire you can measure the pressure of it and see like okay this is a good it's good pressure uh for driving you i think we can come up with some diagnostic tools for um uh, ml systems or machine learning systems or ai system to say you know numerically okay these systems this is how they're operating and these uh, you know these numerical um metrics are telling us it's good or it's not good but once we know then once we know that we can then look at how they're working within a certain context and whether people are satisfied with using it or not so going with my car analogy again you know you can have a pretty good uh, tire pressure for all of your tires but if, if you're driving that car you might just not like driving that car for whatever uh, for how you depending on how you like uh, a certain driving experience right so that they use it also so i think we're, once we have once we have that basic set of metrics diagnostic metrics for the ml uh, system or an ai system we need to then also look at how those systems work within a certain context and i think those metrics are a little bit not a, a, they might be more qualitative in some sense the, the feedback might be more qualitative they might also they might be quantitative in the sense that um they sort of sort of borrow on some um, sort of psychometrics and uh, metrics that are used in psychology to sort of like quantify people's experiences of certain technologies. So yeah. So you're basically looking at the AI system performing its function, and you're scoring the outputs uh, according to a certain metric. Mm -hmm. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah. So that's uh, so right now. I'm, yes. So basically, I'm trying. I'm trying to see how we're doing that right now as as a field, and then uh, and I'm trying to investigate how we should be doing that as a field. One of the things that came up in an earlier interview, we were talking about you know neural networks and how they're somewhat unknowable black boxes that you train them and they do things, and you're not sure why they're doing things. And this was uh, this researcher. I think it was Alexander Wong, who's a, uh, at uh, Waterloo who's looking at explainable AI. So he's actually looking at the software itself and going in and trying to figure out what uh, neurons are, are key to the decisions that this thing is making or what is it concentrating on when it makes its decisions. And you're coming at it, I think, from the other end where you're looking at, okay, it's a black box, but this is what it's doing when it's doing its job and we're scoring it in its performance effectively. Yeah. And even and and the and I would say that explainability like explainability research actually helps with this as well. So in some sense, they are you know that research is allowing us to uh, also be able to diagnose uh, you know a certain system and see what it's doing. And and sometimes I'm actually looking at that field as well and trying to see you know how they they are doing this work um, and trying to um, sort of get inspiration from it. So in the course of your research, what types of AI systems have you been analyzing? What applications have you been looking at? Yeah, so uh, I'm quite early on in my research right now, so just because I just uh, started. Uh, so I've been looking at, as I said, I've been looking at the literature and looking pretty broadly. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the systems that we're currently measuring are uh, in any way um, are recommender systems so, or predictive systems. So they predict... Like they, let's just say you have a system of like as uh, an image classification system, mm -hmm. and so it trains on certain images, and then it will uh, it will see another image and decide whether that image is you know a cat or a dog, for example. And uh, so I, there's a, a lot of the systems that currently uh, we are yeah basically measuring in the literature are recommender system, predictive uh, systems, um, and. Uh, so I have not, at this point, I'm not focusing on a particular system yet. I'm just trying to see how we are uh, trying to measure anything at all. Hmm. Um, and then I will, using sort of, once I've compiled uh, that, then that analysis, I will move forward and sort of decide what to do. So once you've got to the point where you can score these things in ethics, <clears throat> what, can anything be done to constrain things to be ethical? I know from what I've researched, that these systems are trained on massive amounts of internet data, which incorporates in it human bias in a lot of cases. So a lot of the training sets are biased. And I, I read a, 
a paper that was discussing um, systems that were used for hiring. And apparently they... When, when comparing resumes to different positions, they consistently recommended men for executive jobs over women because this was the set of data they were trained on. What can we do to constrain systems to be more ethical? Oh, so there, there is a lot of different, uh, you know, people try to answer this question in many different ways. Uh, so, for example, so you, the problem that you point down sort of falls under the field of like fairness. Uh, and, you know, the, with regards to fairness, there's a lot of different um, techniques people have tried. So there's the people have, let's just say, if you're looking at a AI system, you have your input, you have some sort of your model, and then you have your output. So you can attack this issue from the input side, for example, with a uh, it's making sure that the data that you are gathering is um, is is not it does not have these inherent biases or somehow you that you eliminate these biases in some shape or form, and that can be good in some cases uh, where you know you sort of but in some cases it can also like uh, distort the truth. Uh, so you don't. So, for example, like some people say that okay, like maybe like removing race or removing gender from your data or sensitive attributes from your data will make the make your model less. Uh, less biased. Uh, however, if you remove those data points, and uh, then you also some other data points might be highly correlated with those uh, sensitive attributes, and they might still uh, sort of bias your data in some shape or form. And now that you have, uh, um, like, so for example, if you're looking at, um, uh, if you have a geographic information about people. Um, that those inf those information generally are highly correlated actually with race uh, with race within a certain area. So if you take out race, the, the geographic information could still be quite uh, could be biasing your uh, you know uh, outcome. So but then now that you have removed race from your data, it's going to be hard for you to recognize that geographic information is actually correlated with race. Um, and so then now, now not only you don't know that those are correlated, uh, and you still have biased results. So uh, those, uh, so that, so, but at the same time, in some scenarios as well, you can um, you know augment your data in certain shapes and forms to make it more, uh, I guess, more representative um, of everybody, and not necessarily a certain and sort of um, not not biased result in a certain way. That you can also deal with this in an out so from an output perspective, where you look at you know how likely it is that certain people will have access to a certain resource or or and then sort of try to uh, recognize that there are differences and use the system accordingly. Uh, so now that's so that's fairness issues. When it comes to uh, you know um, another field is a, a transparency and making sure that your system or trying to understand why your systems are making the decisions that they're making. So if it, that, that the researchers that you were mentioning, um, basically once you're able to do that, then you can tell the human user how your system is making these decisions and basically it, it, hopefully that information will be more useful for them in making their decision based on that the recommendations that they have received it, those are some of the ways uh, that we can but i think another there's also like processes uh that some uh, companies are developing so some companies are developing where you know you for you can do like a risk analysis these are like a little bit higher level processes, not as technical. You can do risk analysis on implementing a certain AI system and and try to predict the risks before you actually implement anything. And then that 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 analysis will help you to actually design safeguards in in your system. Oh, is that that actually works? Uh, that yes, I mean, so, I mean, being able to think about the risks before you deploy. I mean, that's a, that's very common practice in other engineering disciplines. Um, but um, so this is it's a, it's not it has not been as common with AI systems because AI, I would say, is coming more from a computer science uh, background. So you're looking at at a failure modes and effects kind of analysis. Exactly. Exactly. Very exactly. familiar. <laughs> so. There's a lot of researchers like you that are concerned, of course, with the ethics of AI, but there are also, I'm sure, a lot of researchers who, is not, who are not as moral as you and are probably being developed to, paid to develop killing machines. What happens if they develop, say, a super intelligent AI before the good guys? Are we in some sort of an AI arms race right now? 
Well, I would say it would definitely, it would not be good at all. <laughs> so that hypothetical scenario would be quite a terrible. Um, and at the same time, though, it is, a, it is a hypothetical scenario. And I think it's really hard to look at the, the, the actual implications of what we would do in that scenario. Like, what, how, how, what have they developed? Where are they at? And, you know, what is our action item in response to what they have done? So it, it's hard for me to sort of say... Um, practically what we would do. I can say that at this point, you know, this conversation about killer robots or lethal autonomous weapons has been something that's been going on in the UN for about 10 years now. So there is a campaign against killer robots and the convention on the certain conventional weapons it has been talking about what each it has been engaging with different countries on this issue uh, and has been uh, coming up with different uh, guidelines and policies on whether we should have killer robots or not should ha not not have them uh, there hasn't been a ban yet um, um, but at the same time there's been a lot of conversation on uh, saying that we should not so there hasn't been a ban, but that there's been a conversation that we should not have this ability in machines without having human control. I wish, I, I guess I, my, my wish would have been to have a stronger, I guess, policy or uh, approach to this from an international level. Uh, I think it, it's very important that we do that. I feel like the it becomes much more like a political game, more so than a technical issue, you know, matter, really. Uh, in these types of scenarios. It's hard to understand or hard hard to believe that you can close this box at this point because, you know, the, the pathway there is pretty obvious for a lot of people. And I know the U.S. is developing autonomous weapons and, you know, they say they won't let them make autonomous decisions to kill, but effectively they are making totally autonomous fighter planes. And, you know, how do you, how do you, put this genie back in the box. I don't know if we can. Yeah, and, and that's very fair. You know, I think that we have seen this historically in many other types of weapons, so like nuclear, you know, weapons. And, you know, I think this is, it's it's another, you know, it almost seems like it's a bit of a hit repeat in some of the other historical <laughs> sort of events in weapons development. And I'm not so sure if, you know, anybody could really, I mean, even previously, whether we could have stopped any of those really from happening, right? So I think um, I think the whether these weapons would be used or not is going to be more of a political conversation that is going to be happening over the next, you know, 20, 10 to 20 years. Um, you know, technologies have that ability to like whistleblow and sort of like speak up in these scenarios, but then they also risk a huge, their, their life basically a lot of the times. There's are there guidelines that we should be putting in place for development of artificial intelligence? I read uh, online about this Asilomar conference, or there's these Asilomar principles of, you know, we shouldn't develop autonomous killer robots. We should watch. A lot of these things are shoulds, and I'm, I'm thinking they should be shalls. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's interesting because there's been a lot of principles that have come out over the past five years. Um, so a lot of AI, I mean, there's probably more than 100 now uh, when it comes to AI systems, uh, 100 sets of principles from all kinds of groups. And a lot of them are saying the same thing, I would say. And it's very interesting that everybody is sort of coming up with their own set of principles just to sort of, and I, and it's, it, and, and I guess the value of this principle is something that we are, as, as our research group also wonders, like what is the value of these principles and how effective are they actually in making any sort of change, really? So I guess the, to answer your question, there are principles. Now, I think the, the challenge for us, a tech, a technology, as technology, technologists or engineers or researchers is going to be to actually bringing these principles and applying them in any way, in ways that makes sense. Mm -hmm. like, like the Asimov rules of robotics, you have to make all the AIs conform. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe that's a bit. So, uh, so I think, yes, yeah, so I would say with the principles, I definitely think there are enough principles out there in for every type a lot of these different systems um, but i think the challenge is to actually implement them yes yes okay. well I'm, I'm hoping that you're you're working on that for us yes yes <laughs> so so here's a question 
we hear uh, famous figures in the media uh, stoking fears about super intelligent AI systems creating an existential threat to human society. Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, Elon Musk have all come forward and saying this is the biggest risk to human society in our future. Are these statements overinflated? What do you feel is the level of risk from artificial intelligence to to society as a whole? I would say those statements are. I can see the value for to those statements in getting the public to at least think about these issues and be become more aware. Because I think having the public, you know, um, considering that these are quite high tech technologies and a lot of people are not necessarily immersed in it, I think there's value in getting people to think about it. And maybe that's one of the ways that people can think about it. But from a technologist perspective, I definitely think that those are overinflated. You know, we're still very much are struggling to, you know, getting like a robot to hand over a water bottle, you know, or, or, or like getting a system that has learned a certain task to like learn something else without being trained on it for hours and hours on end. So there's still a lot of basic technical challenges that we are dealing with. So, so those risks, those, those risks are, are quite far away. And, and so are the, some of the rewards. So I think one of the things that, you know, there's a lot of good that also can come from these technologies. I think they have, there's a lot of potential I would say for them to be to be good, and I think they the rapid sort of development of some of the, for example, the vaccines for the COVID nineteen pandemic, or some of the, even some of the interventions that different technology technologists has done for COVID nineteen uh, in terms of communication and sort of. You know, tracking where the virus is, and I know there's a lot of issues with that too when it comes to privacy. But also, what I'm, I'm trying to highlight is that these technologies have the potential, and they ha- have the potential, and they've also have helped us, you know, solve problems in in meaningful ways uh, in 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 all different sectors. So I think that those you know those risks and also the rewards from having highly intelligent systems are still far away from us in some sense and uh, from a technical perspective you know at the same i think that we can still use this time to increase public's awareness of these systems and how they're affecting their lives so that they can leverage them most effectively for their own purposes and, uh, and another question and this is just a personal interest question what do you think about artificial intelligence and self-awareness is this something that's going to happen it's interesting because a day depends on how you, I guess, define uh, self-awareness, right? So to an extent, you can say, the, okay, to an extent that you can say these systems have a very basic level of self-awareness. And let's say they're trying to reach, like they're playing a game, right? And they're playing a game of chess. To an extent, they know where they are at at the game. And they know how their action is going to affect their ultimate like reward, um, uh, which is after winning the game or not winning the game. So the likelihood of them winning a game. So to an extent, there's a very, very basic, basic, basic level of self-awareness in some of these systems, right? Because they need that self-awareness to actually make the next decision. Now, whether now self-awareness in the sense of, you know, like what emotions and cognition and, you know, like that, that level of self-awareness. I think it, if you want, if we get to the point where we are developing more intelligent systems, so the ones that can do, get, get, that can learn multiple tasks or that, you know, they can trans, do transfer learning in the sense that they learn something and then they can use that to learn something else. Um, I think with the with that, we're also increasing the self-awareness levels of these systems as well. So I, I guess my perspective is that self-awareness goes hand in hand with intelligence level. Interesting. So you think of it as a, as a gradient scale, but there's no, from what you're telling me, you don't feel there's any limit to how far this could go, right? This isn't like effectively limited to uh, always being stupid machines. Yeah, I don't necessarily think that there is a, a limit in that sense, like in the sense of, um, because, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think that there's a limit that we've hit. So we discussed a little bit about, you know, the promise of AI, and you don't think it's really been achieved yet. There's, there's more 
significantly more to come. What applications, for example, do you think are the most promising uh, for artificial intelligence? Where are the where is where are we going to see the biggest improvements in in society from AI? There's many different, but for me, like uh, this, the medical field is something that I've uh, is quite dear, close and dear to my heart, uh, in terms of just my own interest in biomedical engineering. But uh, I, I can say that you know, especially in areas that don't have access to um, highly trained physicians, if we can get, for example, like a doctor or some sort of a case, some sort of like a medical person in a, at a remote area to take a picture of some sort of you know, let's just say skin cancer or something, and then uh, you know, use one of these systems to actually come up with a diagnosis i think that's a huge um uh, that's huge to, to be able to get you know give access to um you know expert opinion in areas that don't generally have that access or that they would have to like travel for so long to be able to get that type of an access i think that is uh, a really valuable um i think that when it comes to to also just managing resources within a hospital setting where if these systems can sort of help you triage who to look at then maybe some time is saved uh, for proper um, care um, or for example dict I know some of my friends are in the medical field and they spend a lot of time dictating and uh, their you know their notes so uh, and that's that basically tires them and I think that takes away from patient care that they can actually give so you know having these uh, systems to recognize natural language dictate properly and you know I think can have a lot of time saving effects and also then not just time saving but also improve care so I, I personally think the medical field uh, has a lot of um, areas in which this type of like a Good functioning AI systems can help quite a bit um, in from everywhere from patient care to like diagnosis to treatment. I think there's a lot of different applications along those lines. For me, those applications are very interesting. Um, having said that, you know, having autonomous cars. Uh, I think also has a lot of potential in some areas, you know, some people who don't have access to transportation um, normally, I think could have access to pay maybe this type of ta transportation, like can be, can it can make it easier for people to get around, whether these people, you know, are in cars or whether even people in wheelchairs uh, who, for example, cannot navigate properly in a care home, having like an autonomously navigated wheel wheelchair can also help them. Um, Quite a bit. So again, I'm coming back to medical system just because I find the, these applications to be probably one of the most fruitful from my perspective um, for AI systems. But um, I'm sure if somebody was more interested in uh, you know criminal like systems and how people are being treated in those systems, I'm sure they can talk to you a little more about those applications too. You mentioned uh, earlier that uh, the vaccination, the vaccine for COVID. Uh, in was uh, aided by artificial intelligence, or there was the possibility that it could have been uh, aided with artificial intelligence. How does how does that played into it? So I know that. Uh, so I I'm not exactly sure about the particular use of AI in the, the vaccines that have been approved, but I know that there is re currently research being done on how to look through certain sort of papers and studies using AI systems and to sort of decide and to using the using AI system to pull pull out sort of which type of treatments are good uh, for a certain condition. So instead of like getting a certain person to look through like 500 or 1000 papers to decide what treatments are, you can use, you can train a system to look at these papers and, the, you know, take out the key information for you. Or if you want to, um, you, I think you can automate the testing of some of these uh, vaccines as well in sort of a more of a simulation level uh, with um, using some AI systems as well. That's pretty cool. Um, okay, so that's the, the, the best. Where, where is the most risk to society? What should be, we be most worried about? Is it, is it the, the autonomous killers? Uh, I would say, yeah, I mean, on a larger scale, let's just say if, if it would be something like an autonomously lethal autonomous weapon. Obviously, something that we should be is very worrisome for everybody in the world. But I think uh, the more real risk right now is um, the unawareness of how these systems are shaping and sort of 
shaping our lives and our habits. I think that's the real mm. risk right now. I like that. Yeah. And um, I think if we can, but I think that's also the solution for that is a lot easier uh, and it's a lot it is like more easily reachable for each individual person. So, you know, some education and some reflection, I would say, about how you're using these systems in your life can go a long way in my opinion. So education, yeah, definitely the root of using a, a dangerous tool is always more education. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're getting towards the end of our, our time slot here. And, and thank you so much for, for coming on and, and chatting with me. My pleasure. One last question for you. What's your favorite science fiction uh, story or TV show or movie? Mm -hmm. I would say, um, so I'm not, I have to like, because I'm not the, like the biggest science fiction person, but one of the things that I really, I guess, enjoyed recently over the past couple of years, a movie was a movie called Mother, uh, which I'm not, it's, it's on Netflix and it's about a, a robot that actually called the mother who raises a human child. Oh, interesting. Uh, yes. And, and the, and, and the idea is that, you know, uh, she is raising this human child and then the child and her will also help raise other and another sort of uh, race of humanity, basically, that is more perfect than the previous uh, that, previous one. That's a theme I've heard a lot is, is how AI helps people to become better. Yeah, it, it was, yeah, it was. I mean, it's an interesting one sort of to think about some of these issues. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for joining me. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much as well for having me. It was a really fun conversation. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please consider visiting my patron page and becoming a patron of this podcast at patron.podbean.com slash the rational view.